All right, good morning. It is good to be here on this uh, on this day, a uh, day that we celebrate uh, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation here at Beautiful Savior. Uh, Reformation Day is actually two days from now, um, October 31st, so it's always fun to ask little kids what's October 31st. It's not Halloween or trick or treating, it's the Reformation. Um, and so if you haven't been here for the first four weeks, we've been, uh, had a video series on the Reformation. We're going to finish that today. It's a 10-minute video this morning, so it just, just uh, ties things up. So I think um, uh, kind of done uh, with the history, and it's going to kind of just tie things together here at the end. And then we're going to spend about uh, 15 or 20 minutes talking about the artwork that hopefully you noticed in the stairwell um, that was given in honor of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and eventually there's going to be some lights so that it's lit up a little bit better and a plaque underneath that explains what it is a little bit uh, as well. But we want to mention that artwork because there's a lot actually in those uh, paintings that we want you to be able to notice and see, and um, it's a very, very uh, Lutheran uh, type of a painting. So, uh, without further ado, Jude, are you ready? Uh, lights, camera, action. In whichever order you want to take that in. Essentially, the Reformation created the modern world. It created new notions of learning, new notions of approaching scripture, new notions of approaching Location, new notions of approaching international politics, new notions of approaching science. A lot of these things had their intellectual roots within the Reformation. Without it, all I can assure you is that this world would look very, very different and think very, very differently without the Reformation. So when Luther starts teaching at you know, University of Wittenberg, society is very structured and very orderly. The church has its place, which is central, and everything fits around that. As Luther begins to do this careful theological thinking and realizing that the Pope is overreaching, and there are some of his teachings which are not actually accurate, and then as he discovers the reality of the gospel, everything starts to change before long. Everything starts to get kind of touched by this because the church's reach is everywhere. And when the church's authority is questioned, it makes all of society come into question. And so now this has an impact on politics and an impact on business and even on the family and marriage. Everything starts to look different and people are rethinking everything. Some of the changes are probably welcome and good. Some of the changes probably weren't what Luther had in mind, especially generations down the road. But all this is coming out of the Reformation. This is all part of the impact of Luther's teaching, thinking about theology, and how it starts to affect all of life. The Reformation had a huge impact on education, which is with us to this day. The idea of compulsory education, universal education for girls as well as boys. The idea of the, the work of a teacher as a real calling, a calling from God, which we have largely lost in society today, but that was very much there with the Reformation. And the idea of a curriculum that was broad-based, that would teach the, the liberal arts, that would make people into well-rounded church members and citizens. That all goes back to the Reformation. European society was already in transition. It was changing, medieval patterns were breaking down. The Reformation actually is going to accelerate it. And there are certain trends within European society that the Reformation is, is going to emphasize, this notion of the individual. So Luther's concern was the, for the individual to establish a relationship with God by grace through faith. So this notion of the individual is going to be a very important element in modern society. Um, the concept that the state being in charge of the church is in some sense a modern concept as well, which we can see beginning in the Reformation. Um, changing social patterns, uh, the changing structure of the family, um, many of these are legacies of the Reformation. What does the Reformation mean today from a historical perspective? For one, it's uh, kept the Pope out of international politics and it created a new situation 
where nation states use more reason of state as a reason for conducting foreign policy rather than notions of Christendom. The General Reformation, it actually contributed many of the elements of our constitutional democracy, of our republic. It contributed things like the idea that the individual should be free to speak. It contributed the idea that the individual should be free to worship. Uh, although that is not immediate, that is the consequence of the Thirty Years' War. It also contributes uh, the idea of representative democracy and contributes the idea of rights, at least for Christians, which then would be extended later to rights for all individuals in the time of the Enlightenment. One of the really great things about right teaching is that it starts to impact all of life. Um, and that's one of the things I get excited about with theology is it's not just about me and God or what happens when I die or what happens on Sunday morning. Good theology impacts everything. Now one of Luther's great gifts that beautifully illustrates this is his teaching on vocation. Luther realized that one of the big mistakes that was being made in the medieval world was this notion that if you really wanted to serve God, if you really wanted to get right with God, you had to forsake the world and go join a monastery or a convent, and then there you could really pursue godly things, and there you could get right with God. And Luther came to realize that not only is this wrong because it teaches works righteousness, trying to earn favor with God, but it's also wrong because it destroys this world. Because it takes a man out of his relationships and responsibilities in this world and drives him into this isolated life in the monastery, where he, he's of no good to anyone. So Luther said, no, the doctrine of vocation is God's affirmation of this world, God's affirmation of the things we do in this world. So when a man chooses to marry and raise children, this is good and God-pleasing. So this allowed Luther to invest heavily in his own married life. He loved his wife, he loved his children, he loved music, he loved meals with his family, and he learned to delight in those domestic things. In the medieval world, those were always seen as low, down, common things. Those weren't holy works. Those were just, yeah, he's got to do that. Ah, it's too bad somebody has to do this. But Luther said, no, this is holy, beautiful, godly work. And so he elevated family and married life and children and parenting to a high level which was unheard of in his world. And this, I think, legacy endures to this day. So a Christian can embrace his responsibilities and her responsibilities in this world because it's God-pleasing and it's holy and it's honorable. That's kind of a, a great gift, I think, that Luther gave us. Marriage in the Middle Ages had been a sacrament. When Luther married Katie, um, Katharina von Bora, um, he, was, he was actually making a statement, actually more than one statement by that act. One is priesthood of all believers. What he was saying is that the priests are not a special class that are closer to, closer to God than anybody else. Um, he was also establishing a new tradition among Protestants, the Protestant parsonage. So the wife and the family become, become a very important part of the Reformation process. More broadly, what we're going to see happening is the extension of the authority of the state over areas that in the Middle Ages had been the province of the church. So marriage is one of those examples. Education is another. As modern American Christianity drifts farther and farther away from Scripture, the Reformation gives us a model. Go back to the Scriptures. Go back to sola scriptura. Focus on the Scriptures. Focus on faith. Focus on the truth that God provides us. So Lutheranism is a, an amazingly resilient phenomenon globally, and Lutheranism is now clearly a global movement, which is one of the most exciting parts of Lutheranism. The average Lutheran in the world now looks like an East African, because we see now the church just blossoming, more than blossoming, booming in East Africa, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, in Madagascar, and so Lutheranism is proving itself to be amazingly resilient globally. So I think part of the resilience of Lutheranism was established by Luther himself. You see, Luther demanded that the Bible be translated into the language of the people. In fact, he once said, God be praised, finally the Bible is in the language of the people. So there's something that is native to Lutheranism around adaptation or the vernacular or cultural contextualization. And I think that's one of the variables that gives Lutheranism this kind of resilience through the 20th century to find it growing again in places like Latin America and Asia and Africa. 
Luther starts small, starts innocently, but God has other intentions for this. And he, his intention is to bring truth back to his church. And that's what the real legacy is. The gospel is being proclaimed again. The promise is there. The clarity of God's truth is there. That's the great heritage. And that, I think, is the, the responsibility that we who carry the name Lutheran have today. Our, our, our charge, then, is to keep on moving forward, teaching the full counsel of God. All that he says about the gospel, God's free gift, all that he says about this world and how embracing this world is a good and God-pleasing thing and living in this world for the sake of the world, that's what God put us here to do. That's part of our legacy. And when we are able to help the church, the wider church, come to terms with this, this is a really good thing. And this is part of what it means to be a little different. The greatest thing about the Reformation are the, the solos. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, scripture alone. Because in reality what it does is it establishes the worth of a human being before God in a way that can't be done by people. It's done by God in Jesus Christ. Now if you really believe that, if that's what you believe the dignity of humanity is, it changes everything about what it means to be human together in society. And so there's going to be tremendous change in society, a lot of it for, for great good. But it comes back to that unique dignity before God in Jesus Christ alone. What a great way to live together. several of those uh, same kind of concepts that, that were really uh, important at the time of the Reformation and really became important then, um, not just in the Lutheran church or in the Christian church, but in the world, really. Um, education being a huge one. Luther wrote so much about education that it spilled over into secular society in a gigantic way. I mean, just just had a tremendous spillover into secular society and the concept of, uh, of girls being educated and a, a wide range of subjects and those kinds of things. Uh, it's why when the Saxon Lutherans came over from uh, Saxony and uh, the LCMS was eventually formed, um, Lutheran schools became very important in the Lutheran church um, as a way of promoting the gospel. Right? Jesus every day. That's what I'm, I'm fond of saying that about Lutheran schools. Uh, Jesus every day. You don't get that in a public school. I'm not going to condemn you for sending your kids to a public school, but uh, the, the awesome thing about Lutheran schools, and, and even if your kids don't go to a Lutheran school, it's why we support Lutheran education here at Beautiful Savior, regardless of where your kids go to school, is because... It is meant, it is meant, number one, to be the promotion of the gospel in the world around us and preparing, preparing Christians for life in this world. And, and you don't get that at the public school. You just don't. Um, and so uh, that's why we, that's why I really think that as a congregation, we should and need to and continue to support Lutheran education. Like I said, regardless of where you send your kids, that's fine. It, it costs money to send your kids to Lutheran school. Um, but, but I find that it's worth it, and, and I'm glad that we make that choice, and others in our congregation make that choice. That's great. Um, if you haven't, that's fine. I'm not condemning you. Um, but uh, that's the whole idea about Lutheran schools, though, um, is, that, uh, is that place that promotes the gospel, prepares Christians for the world uh, in which they live. And I, I had a person tell me once, well, you, you can't shelter your kids forever. Uh, I send my kids to public school so that they're not sheltered. And I was like, well, bad parent. Why would you not want to shelter your kids for as long as you can? The world is in Lutheran schools, too. They know the world. It's on TV in your home, right? I mean, they're not sheltered from the world by going to Lutheran school. But, but they're prepared to face the world 
by going to a Lutheran school, perhaps better. But that's just my soapbox for Lutheran schools. If you have little kids and you're thinking about uh, uh, them growing up, <clears throat> we have some Lutheran schools in the area that are really uh, quite excellent and, and really take on those tasks. Um, the other really huge thing that comes out of Luther and the Reformation is his idea of vocation. Um, and uh, what, what we do what we do is really in service to God, and it's everything that we do. And, and Dr. Bierman had a good quote. He said, the doctrine of vocation is God's affirmation of the things we do in this world. So when a man chooses to marry and raise children, this is a good and God-pleasing thing. Luther elevated family and married life and children and parenting to a high such a, to a high level which was unheard of in the world of his day. And this, I think, uh, and this, I think, legacy endures to this day so that Christians can embrace his responsibilities or her responsibilities in the world because it's God pleasing and it's holy and it's honorable. So the work that God gives you to do is holy and honorable work. Whether it's husband or wife, uh, son or daughter, um, parent or child, um, worker or employer, whatever it is that God gives you to do, that's your vocation. And it is to be honorable and God-pleasing. Honorable and God-pleasing work. Doesn't mean that you go and you talk about your um, boss and behind his back and, and slice him down, right? It doesn't mean that you go and talk to your coffee clutch about how how uh, much of a deadbeat your husband is, right? That's that's not the good and honorable work of a Christian. The good and honorable work of a Christian is to um, pray for those around you, support those around you, uh, work diligently in the in the areas that God has given you to work, and support others in the work that they do as well. Uh, other thoughts or comments from the recap, or the, uh, not recap, the, the summary, the, the ending that we just saw. Any other things jumped out at you? He had no worth before God because he couldn't do enough. He couldn't do enough. And so his worth was completely based on works. Well, one of the, one of the consequences of Luther's teaching is that you have worth based solely on God's mercy in Jesus Christ is that then people said, well, then I don't have to work. Right? If I'm not saved by my good works, then I don't have to do good works. And Luther quickly jumped on that and said, no, 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 no. The Lord placed you here to work and serve your neighbor. And, and Luther, one of Luther's really kind of more famous quotes probably um, is something along the lines of, um, God does not need your good work, but your neighbor does. And if you aren't serving your neighbor, and, and really, husband, wife, children, employer, church, whatever, people, pastor, if you're not serving the people around you, you're not being faithful. And you're despising 
the love that Christ has for you, or that God has for you in Christ. You're despising that love. Because you're refusing to work in the vocations that God has placed you in. And it's not pick or choose. I don't like my pastor, so I won't work real well in that vocation as a member. Or I don't like my boss, so I won't work real well in, in that vocation as an employer, employee. Or I don't like my wife, so I won't work real well in that vocation. Right? No. Nope. You don't get to pick and choose the vocations that you're faithful in. You get to be faithful in all of that. Right? You get to be faithful in all of that. I don't get to pick and choose and say, oh, I like that member, and I don't like that member, and I like that member, and I'll serve that member, and I won't serve that member. Well, how ridiculous would that be? You wouldn't want me to be your pastor. Well, you don't get to do that either, right? We, we love and serve each other in all vocations that God gives us. Another thing that really stood out to me this time around for this series was I always thought about the Reformation as how it's impacted us as believers. And it's really this model was really pulled out. It's more like a tree with, with impacts everywhere across history. And even to the point where we may have impacted our Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Mark. I think uh, Mark, Kurt, Mark, whatever. All the same, all the same. Obviously, uh, we don't like him as much. All the same. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, no, that's a great point. Right, the Reformation. I think a lot of times when the Reformation gets studied in Lutheran churches, it's really kind of combined to how it affects us. Right, and I think you're right. The genius of this, and I'm just repeating what you said for the camera. Um, the genius of this third part, this third year in our study, is that it really opens up to a farther reaching field that, that this Luther impacted all areas of life. Just all areas of life. It just looks like the history fits itself. If you look at Old Testament times and coming up to the Pharisees during Christ's time, you know, Christ comes in and says, okay, you know, what was the second commandment? Love the name of yourself. And then somewhere the church kind of loses all that and then pick up Martin Luther and then opens it up and says, okay, got it? This is what Christ said. This is what the Bible says. This is what God wants you to How would you want you to live and not just be controlled by the pharmaceutical uh, church at that time? <clears throat> yeah, and, and I think um, you said kind of repeats itself. I think it's repeating itself now, right. even uh, as well. And I really like, I don't know if it was Dr. Bierman or somebody on the uh, video said um, it's really, uh, the Reformation is always a call to go back to Scripture. Go back to Scripture. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, it was kind of the purpose of this sermon today, is that we need to be in the Word. Full of Scripture uh, ha has meaning for our lives, and we don't just discount it. We don't set it aside because of our ponderings and what we want to do and how we want to live. We don't set it aside. We, we cling to that sure word. And, and there are all kinds of Christian churches today that, that are kind of setting aside um, God's word, the truth of God's word, and that's problematic. And, and I think uh, uh, Reformation uh, is, is very much a reminder, a call to say, nope, be faithful to God's word. Talking in theology of Christianity, the emphasis on um, churches that will bring us to the word so that we can live by it. <coughs> yeah, right. Um, one quick, one quick thing to say from last week. Um, last week, I was talking about human reason and be careful of human reason. And um, I, I guess I confused at least one person, maybe more, because I got an email. Um, when we talk, when I talk about human reason, I, I short circuit that conversation because the, the premise is what I said at the beginning. Human reason is a slave to scripture, not its master. The problem with human reason is when you seek to make human reason the master of scripture. So, all kinds of denominations have all kinds of really intelligent people and intelligent theologians who study God's Word. 
greatly. I mean, maybe more than I do. We read that, uh, like, frequently. Yeah, we read some of those theologians um, uh, as pastors. So, so, um, uh, so denominations have all kinds of learned people. The, the issue with human reason is what your, what your premise is and what your um, uh, uh, preconceived notions is the wrong word. Presuppositions. presuppositions. What your presuppositions are as you face Scripture. Right? So um, uh, we were talking about this. Um, Calvin's presupposition yep. when it comes to Christ is... That the, 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 the Lord's Supper. Yeah. yeah. So Calvin's basic presupposition was Latin phrase "finitum non capax infinity est." I didn't remember the Latin phrase, so I thought I'd have to throw it out for you. Basically, the finite, so earthly matter, the creation, is not capable of containing that which is infinite. So Calvin looked at the Lord's Supper, he looked at our little wafers and the wine, and he said, no way! There's no way that it can hold the body, the infinite body and blood of Jesus. So that's, that's an example of the way that his presuppositions colored his conclusions about his theology. Surely, the finite is not capable of containing yeah. the and, infinite glory. And so. that, then, is the example of human reason becoming the master of Scripture, right? Whereas Luther, obviously, Lutherans use human reason all the time to interpret Scripture. So, I mean, I didn't mean that, I didn't mean to make it sound like human reason bad, um, Lutheran good. Nah, no, human, human reason is good, right? I just I just shorthanded it because I said it at the beginning and I didn't I didn't explain it I guess well enough and I didn't mean to cause confusion. But um, the idea is uh, we of course use human reason. But Luther's human reason stopped where scripture stopped. So that when Jesus says this is my body, this is my blood, Luther said that is means is. And I'm not going to go farther with what I think Jesus can and can't do. Right? That's the difference. And as soon as I go farther and talk about what I think Jesus can and can't do, then I'm making Scripture a slave to human reason. And, and then that becomes a potential problem, if not worse. Does that make sense? Is that better? Is that better? So, we of course use human reason. But, but uh, I mean, we use human reason all the time. Uh, if you came to Vicar in my uh, Mark uh, Bible class, uh, midweek Bible class on Wednesday and Thursdays, uh, we, we use human reason all the time to explain what God's Word is saying. But we don't go farther than what Scripture says. That was Luther's, Luther's stopping point is... Let the word of God speak and, and don't impose myself on top of it. All right, I have one here and then one here. Well, I just said, does that mean, what does that mean when it says, this is most certainly true? I always wondered if that one he meant by that. When he finishes the end of the article, the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I was. No, I've never read anything about what Luther meant by that. It's, it's, it's kind of like, a, it, you know, there are things that you can find. You, you can, yeah, I think it's probably an amen. This is most certainly true. Probably amen, amen. This is most certainly true. Um, good pickup, thank you. Uh, visitor in the front row. Um, always, always, always glad to have the smarter. Uh, no, I mean. Uh, I'm kidding, um, but no, thank you. That's good. Um, sometimes we can mine what Luther meant when he what he wrote, and sometimes we can't. Right? Uh, um, one little word can fell him. Right? A lot of pastors say, "Oh, to tell us die. When, when he cries out from the cross, it is finished." That's not the word. It's liar, liar, and it's in one of his letters to. Do you remember? Uh, he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to somebody explaining what he meant by one little word. Nobody knows that. It's liar. Liar is the word because Satan is a liar. Call him a liar and he falls. Right? Go back to hell, Satan, because you're a liar. And nothing more than that. Yeah. Um, okay, Josh? Josh? <laughs> 
Y yes. Yes. Okay, so one of the best examples. It's like sometimes, sometimes, sometimes when you all say something, my brain takes a little bit of time to catch up with what the heck you mean. So I, I think I have what you mean. If I'm wrong, please interject. So Josh said uh, a great example of human reason is the astronomer that came, right? And so what, what the astronomer says is, look, we have all kinds of evidence. If you weren't here for him, you can find his presentation online on our YouTube channel, uh, Beautiful Savior Lutheran Olathe. It'll pop up, find uh, Paul Edmund. Um, but he came and he talked about the age of the earth and, and evolution and, and how we coordinate that as Christians. And, and his thing is, Scripture says six days. Science says we have an old earth. Or at least an old universe. We might actually have a pretty young Earth, but we have an old universe. And, and there's science to back that up. The, the Big Bang Theory can't just be dismissed as, oh, that doesn't work. It's actually science, and, and, and it's science that actually seems to work. Well, what do you do with that? Well, it, to the Christian who believes that what God says is what God means, God created an old earth. I don't have a problem with that. I don't need to impose my human reason on top of what God says and say, well, God really meant that he created, you know, using the process of evolution over the course of um, 12 billion years. I don't need to say that because it's not what God says. And, and, and science says we have an old earth but, or an old universe. That's fine. Then God created an old universe. Why wouldn't have God created the stars so Adam and Eve could see them? I mean, I don't think it's a silly supposition. So, yeah, that's a that's another practical example of that thing. Is that what you meant, Josh? All right, very good. I'm glad I glad I did that correctly. All right, Tiffany, last comment, and then we're gonna move on. From the video, I also this is it. Make it good because this is the last comment. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Well, I like
was really to remove the Pope from secular politics, to remove the church from secular politics. Um, uh, there, there is not, there, there is, we are not benefited when the church runs the state. Right? Separation of church and state doesn't actually exist in America. It, it's the anti-establishment clause that the state may not establish a religion. There, there is no such thing as separation of church and state in America, even though that's what people always talk about. But, but the, the point is, is the church isn't in charge of the state because we don't have a theocracy anymore. That was Old Testament stuff. Right? That was Old Testament stuff. All right, let's close with a word for our gracious Heavenly Father. We rejoice and give you thanks for the Word made flesh that, that undergirds everything that we are and, uh, and speak as your people, as Christian people. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to hold fast to that truth uh, of Scripture that sets us free from sin and death and the power of the devil and then inspires us to live the vocations that you have given us to live in our daily lives. Help us to be faithful in the work that you give us and, and especially faithful in the opportunities that you give to speak about Jesus, the Word made flesh, who suffered and died for our salvation. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. Go well, peace to the Lord. Have a great week. All right, now, uh, one last comment. Next week, oh, one last November, comment. Starts, Freeze. November starts next week. Uh, for the month of November, we're doing a special Bible class. We're going to talk about the end times. Uh, it's not just a revelation study, but it's the end of your life, the end of the world's life, when Christ comes again. So, meet us back here next Sunday for a